Okay. Um, it's not really right to claim me as an international speaker. I'm actually a boy from Northland and I just happen to reside over on the West Island. Okay, let's see if we can get the technology working. So you have to sit through the compulsory 10-second uh, advertorial for Lend-Lease. It's just part of the deal. Um, many of you know us. I've been here and presented on some of this work before. I always feel like apologising a bit like James had to, that we only get to show you the work from three or four years ago. We never get to show you the really cool stuff we're cooking up now. Something to do with competitive advantage. So our claim to fame is we're an integrated um, business. So we play across the entire value chain. Uh, and it's really our point of difference. And by that, I mean we do everything from fund management, development, um, design, construction, heavy engineering. We've got the largest road construction business in Australia. I'm not sure that's a claim to fame or not. Um, we also have the largest retirement operation in Australia. We have 14,000 people live in our retirement villages. So we know a lot about creating assets and owning assets and operating assets. And from that, we mean, it means we, we wear many hats. Um, and so we, we tend to have a, a reasonable understanding about the raft of problems that confront our industry, or at least we should. So I've been with the group for uh, 24 years, which is a bit embarrassing to admit, because it either means Lendlease is a great company or I'm just incompetent at finding another job. Um, and I was actually employed initially here in New Zealand back in the day when we had a building business called Civil and Civic that some of you will remember. Um, I'm an architect, I did my training here in Auckland. Um, like most architects in the room, I don't particularly profess to love numbers, but when you work in the development arm of a corporation like Lend-Lease, they beat a love of numbers into you, so I'm going to share a few numbers with you. First one, this 1100 here. So just to explain this, uh, since I was born, and I'll just clarify that I'm less than 50 years old, um, the world's population has more than doubled. It's gone from 3.6 billion in the year of my birth to 7.6 billion now. And hold that thought for a moment because the United Nations is telling us that it's going to reach another 3.5 billion in urban areas alone by 2050. So that's the entire population of the world when I was born will be added in the next 32 years. And so if you do the maths and you say, well, let's assume that number of people are all going to be housed in, in urban dwellings that might have 250 people per building, which is a pretty large building, right? If we assume that and then we divide it by the amount of time left, uh, we, we get to a number between 11 and 1,200. It's close to 1,200, actually. And that's each and every day for the next 32 years we need to deliver nearly 1,200 buildings. Now, if you're like me and you don't like working weekends, that, numbers will go, that number will go up to closer to 1,600. So 1,600 buildings each and every day for 32 years, except for the weekends. And that number excludes every non-residential building. So none of the schools, shops, prisons, whatever else is required to, to support that increase in society. And so I think if you're in this room, that's a fantastic story. It means you've actually made a great choice and you're in a growth industry and there's a lot of work coming. Um, so, so take that for what it is, it is a great story. And I have no idea, by the way, how many buildings are delivered each and every day in the world. And I can't find those stats, but one would hazard a guess it's significantly less than that number. Unfortunately, we move on, we get to these numbers. So these numbers are not quite so cheerful. And so just to unpack them a little bit, 40% inefficiency. So this is waste. And this is not just material waste, this is all forms of waste. This is waste capital, it's waste human capital, uh, it's waste time, it's wasted effort. And uh, McKinsey's released a paper, which I'm sure all of you read in 2016. It was a lovely damning report on the global construction industry pointing out this number. Now, David Chandler's here in the room somewhere today. He's been writing about this for a very long time, much longer than McKinsey's have thought to voice an opinion on it. And he can probably underpin a lot more data behind this. He's not been shy about telling me the number of times that Lend-Lee's cranes are sitting idle and that's another form of waste. And in my experience, there's been zero gain in productivity in the last 30 years. And my yardstick for that would be to look at something like the structure cycle of buildings. So when I joined Civil and Civic in New Zealand, our yardstick was to do a concrete frame building in approximately four days per cycle. Our business is so much smarter now, it does it at eight days per cycle. <laughs> and if you go back 80 years to the construction of the Empire State Building, they did it in one day per cycle. So something's not really working in the productivity side of our life. And it may have something to do with the fact that we have one of the lowest rates of adoption, another wonderful McKinsey report, said we were second lowest only to hunting and agriculture. They then revised the report and said, we got it wrong, you're actually the lowest. The hunters have got more tech than you do. 
And that's probably something to do with the rate of spending in our industry. So across the real estate and construction sectors globally, we spend about 1% of our turnover on technology. And most industrials would spend closer to 7%. And if you were in the technology world, you would spend somewhere between 30 and 50%. And I'm using technology as a stand-in for R&D, and if I was to put an R&D up, number up here, I'd, meet, I'd need many decimal points. So it's a truly sad state of affairs. And we know where we want to get to. We're all hearing about Industry 4.0. It sounds very exciting. So, you know, we're talking about lots of automation. We're talking about artificial intelligence, edge devices, cloud computing, all these things. And it is pretty interesting, and maybe there's an opportunity for our industry to bypass the first three industrial revolutions that it neatly sidestepped and catch up on the fourth one. <laughs> and this stuff's coming at us, and we've heard a little bit about it today, and robotics is a hot topic all around the world. It's where the venture capital money sits. Um, 3D printing, we want to get it out of little plastic objects into real buildings, and that's probably going to happen. There's some pretty cool stuff going on. There's excavators now that are autonomous that use drones to actually work out where they've got to cut and place material. People are inventing robots to lay bricks, although I'm not quite sure you want to take a wet trade and automate it. I would have a different view on what you might do there. But the point is, we're not quite sure how this is all going to unfold. So some of these robots might be off-site, and some of them might be on-site. And it's too early in the story to really place the bets. So what are we doing? Well, we've narrowed our focus in some regard, and we've said, let's just talk about digital fabrication, because some of this is real, and we can exploit it today. And for us, digital fabrication, we could get lost in definitions, but it's really just the search for the shortest path from the design process to the construction process through the least number of hands. Can we take a file and can we send it to a factory and can we manufacture from that? And to go back to that waste factor, if you're a design professional in the room and you think you're off the hook and the waste is sitting in the manufacturing or construction side of the industry, I'd, I'd like to suggest to you that actually design have a lot of responsibility around waste. And us as clients and developers, we have a great deal of responsibility as well. So for us, what we're thinking about with digital fabrication is the starting point. And our starting point has been structure. And you might say, well, why worry about digitally fabricating the structure? There's a lot of great structural ideas out there. James showed us some this morning. But we're borrowing our cue here from industries like uh, aircraft manufacturing and automotive manufacturing. And you take ideas from other manufacturing industries with great caution because there's as many differences as there are opportunities for similarities. But if you think about what Boeing or Airbus are doing here, you know, this, is a, this is a product with over two million components to it. And the only one they make themselves is the structure. It's the fuselage or the body shell. It's the thing that is the giant organising principle for everything that happens thereafter. And so for us, a building structure is pretty much the same deal. It's our core organising principle and everything else hangs off it. And if we can prefabricate structure and we can do it digitally and we can do it precisely, there's two things that are really opening up for prefabrication. The first thing is we're getting into a different realm of tolerances. We're talking about things made where you can measure differences in microns. And at the utmost, you're measuring them in one or two millimetres. And that changes the game for everything that has to follow on. It can now fit precisely to something as opposed to the vagaries of concrete placement. And we always say we've done well when the concrete's on the right side of the street. <laughs> the second thing that's happening is you can change the paradigms around the sequence of installation. So when you see modular componentry added to these modular structures, you're not waiting for, for concrete to cure and to be stripped out. And perhaps you're placing those modules at exactly the same time that you're placing the, the structural elements. And by doing so, there's a whole different logistics game to be played, and there's a different utilisation of the plant and equipment and people that are on the job sites. So structure for us, it's our gateway drug. And if we can get people addicted to digitally fabricated structures, we think we can turn them into prefabrication junkies. But I need to be really clear. This is not a story about wood, right? And it's not just a story about digital fabrication. We very much believe, and we've learnt this the hard way, that you actually need a systemised approach. And systemisation is a complex topic, and there hasn't been an enormous number of precedent successes, but we're starting to see some of them in different parts of our industry around the world. And for me, the word I hate most is standardisation. Now, standard parts was part of what led to the first industrial revolution. It was a great concept, and it really suits the idea of mass manufacturing. But if we're in a digital world, 
We don't need mass production and we don't need standardisation. If you think about standardisation, it's one of the problems that prefabrication has faced for the last century. Because if I talk about standardisation to you as a client, what you will hear is boring repetition, project homes, Leningrad. So that's not the kind of outcome that engenders success. So we have to think about ways where we can generate results that have the advantages and values of standardisation but are non-standard. And this is where you really get into trouble when you start comparing things like making cars with making buildings. Because what we know about making buildings is they need to be contextually relevant. It's not something rolling off an assembly line that can be blind to the geography it's going to sit in. So without going into some of the work that we're doing that I'm not allowed to share, I might just borrow an example from Volkswagen. And this is, this is an interesting system that they deployed a few years ago uh, called MQB, and I can't give you the German translation for that. But the concept's interesting because what they did is they put aside their standard parts thinking and they said, well, where's the engineering complexity? And for Volkswagen as a car maker, they said our engineering complexity sits in the engine bay. There's a lot of complex geometry. There's a lot of safety issues in there. It's where the power plant's got to get connected to the fuel source. It's where the steering's got to all come to life. And so they said, that's 60% of our engineering spend. So if we standardise that engine bay, what that means we can do is we can be entirely flexible about the rest of the car. So as a consequence, what Volkswagen's doing is they're making 40 different cars under four different brands. So Audi, um, Volkswagen, Seat, Skoda, everything from hatchbacks to panel vans to convertibles, luxury to budget, is built off exactly the same system. And what they've worked out is by putting all the complexity into that one place, the engine bay, and making that a relatively static thing that runs within parametric design, the rest of it can be very flexible, very cheaply. You can stretch the sheet metal, you can stretch the interior schemes to do whatever has to be done. And what we've been doing is borrowing heavily on that concept. And it's something I think uh, Mark was talking about earlier. The idea of a spine of a building that has a, a degree of reuse, of repurposing, and other parts of the building are much more flexible to deal with context. And this is where we start to get back to design as a prefabricated concept, more so than the actual building fabric itself. And one of the reasons systemization is really important is what you can systemize, you can automate. And so automation is another hot topic. Everyone's talking about the transition to digital, and many of us in this room are probably already practicing some aspects of it. And so uh, a bit like Brookfield, we're writing software as well. Uh, I don't have any of the algorithms to show you. Our software is looking at the issues of generative design and how we can combine things like what we're already doing as an industry with parametric geometry, although I'd argue we're not doing enough of it because we keep bespoke designing buildings. Combining that with things like planning code as algorithms, so instead of doing a design and then wondering whether it conforms with the law, have the generative design actually respond to the law. But then layering on another issue on top of that again, which is to say, okay, it fits the geometry once we want so we can prefabricate, it meets the law, does it actually perform in accordance with what customers and clients actually need to achieve? So, you know, the little fire steer example there, um, just as one sort of subset of what we're doing, what the tool there is actually doing is it looks at the occupation density in the floor and it calculates the number of people going down the fire stairs. And so it's basically double checking the code to say, this thing works in the event of an emergency. And we can run different scenarios and say, well, what if we doubled the density on a floor or halved it or some other issue came to bear? So this is part of our future. I just want to digress briefly at the risk of offending everybody in the room who loves prefab, but in my role, uh, I pretty much get an approach every week from someone who's got something to sell us, a, a novel business idea, they've been investigating prefabrication, they've got a, they've got a system, um, they've probably got a platform because that's an even better word than system. Let's, let's talk about the platform I'm going to sell you. But often what you find when you scratch in behind the surface is they're really just talking about construction in a shed. And if you go back 150 years ago to what was happening with you know, the Anglican Church up at St John's and Meadowbank making you know, small wooden buildings and shipping them around New Zealand, construction in a shed made a lot of sense because the skills and the materials weren't out in the places where they had to send the stuff they were making. But if you look at it in our industry, in heavy duty construction, this stuff often doesn't add up. If you take 
construction activities off-site and put them under a nice tin roof and you say, well, I've now controlled that huge variable nasty thing called weather. Right? And I've improved ergonomics and materials get handled straight up to the back of wherever we're making stuff. That sounds pretty good. There's definitely some advantages, there's some attack on that waste. But the problem with it is often the cost of that shed and the logistics that have increased in complexity have also increased in cost. And maybe, maybe it's just breaking even. And if you take something that's breaking even to our conservative business model, people won't buy it. So what you need is not construction in a shed. You need something that is going to systemically attach that 40%, attack that 40% waste. And the other comment I want to make about this, and it's a learning of ours that we can be transparent about, is if you have what you believe to be a system, so we opened a bathroom pod business in Brisbane a few years back. We made 8,000 bathroom pods. They were great pods, we loved it. A lot of defects taken off the construction process. But really, the challenge there is they were systemic, but they were rigid. So you can have any colour as long as it's black. And we've got four pod models. Oh, OK, we'll make it eight because four didn't quite get there. But those eight can only be arranged in a floor plan one particular way. And so it starts to become very deterministic about what the product is. And again, that's not what our industry is about. We need something that's much more flexible than that. So this business that we opened last year is actually our third factory. Our first factory had no digital componentry to it and no system. Our second factory had no digital componentry to it and a system with no flexibility. And now our third factory is entirely digital. And I'm going to walk you through a couple of the systems that are already public. And I'm not going to talk about some other systems that are in development. But please don't take from this that to make this succeed, you need a highly automated approach. This facility is highly automated. The whole thing can run with five people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you actually need to have these systems that underpin what you're doing. It's not about the technology that's out on the factory floor. So the first system that we've been working up, I showed many people in this room this thing last year. It's a frame system for commercial office buildings. And uh, the first building we delivered in this was actually a little library building. And then the one we actually really got focused on in anger was this project at Barangaroo International House, which has caught a little bit of media in the last year. So it's been occupied by Accenture. Uh, I was in there last week. I bumped into a few Accenture people who had no idea who I was, just another tourist walking through looking at wooden, wooden bits. Uh, and when you ask the people from Accenture, the real clients and customers, what do they think about the building, they're delighted by it. And they don't know anything about the fact it was prefabricated. There's nothing there that's determining the product. They just like the feel of the building and the light and the qualities of the material. So this system has now evolved a little bit. And we've taken it from this project in Sydney and deployed it on this project in Brisbane. And we did all the usual things that we shouldn't do. We actually started again with a whole new team. And we had a completely new set of consultants. And of course, we didn't use the same architects. So you know, instead of crawl, walk, run, you do a lot of teaching people to crawl over again. We've got a whole business full of crawlers. So don't take that the wrong way. Um, the systemic learning is there, but it's perhaps not as good as if you'd kept the same team together and transported them. And so this project, this is a shot from last week. Apologies for the quality of it. It's one of my iPhone shots. Uh, this is the same system, but it's being deployed in a scheme that's four times larger. So it's 20,000 square metres of GFA, and it's 10 storeys. And one of the systemic learnings, the scissor lift in the uh, lower part of the image there is the facade installer putting the bracketry on. So that, that's the facade starting to be installed um, before the floor above is even complete, which is pretty unusual. We'd normally wait till we had the structure at least three or four floors clear of the uh, facade system. And in the case of International House, we finished the structure before we started the facade system. So upshot of that is we should have this building waterproof within one week of the structure finishing, which is kind of a nice thing. Um, the red stuff, if you're wondering, that's just safety mesh to catch uh, workers who aren't paying attention. And so then we take the same logic and we bring it back to Sydney. And so this is a twin or a cousin of the first building, International House, being delivered right next door to it. Uh, again, change the architect. Uh, you've got to keep changing architects so they get stale. Um, but we kept the same construction team. And we really went back and analysed what happened on the first building and the second building. And now we're really starting to poke hard into how do we make this more systemic? How do we get minutes out of every connection that needs to be made on site? How do we reduce the mass of every beam and every column? And we don't stop there. We keep going. So 
we're in Perth developing this project at a, at a development we call Waterbank. And so this is another large, um, low-rise commercial building. It's actually two big buildings, the circles obscuring the whole second building there, joined with a, a, an atrium and a circulation space. And again, it's carrying forward all of the systemic learnings out of the last project. And then one other system that we've been working on for quite a while is a wall system. And so I first met James Murray Parks when he turned up and he said, that Forte project you built in Melbourne had 30% too much mass in it. And uh, that was a bit of a shock because I didn't know who James Murray Parks was. Um, and he was right. And we'd actually just done the maths ourselves a week earlier. So I wondered who was reading my emails, particularly when they had a multiplex hat on their head. Um, and this is what I mean by system. You've got to go back and say, well, if we really think there's a future in this, it's only going to work if we can keep refining it and improving it. And so we did take 30% of the mass out. And so my US colleagues have been delivering these wall systems into a hotel product. We're the developer of 5,000 hotel rooms in the US. Uh, I make no apologies for the architecture. That's our client, um, IHG, and their specifications for what a US three-star hotel should look like. Um, but believe it or not, that monolithic brick building is, of course, a CLT load-bearing wall system. And the next obvious opportunity would be change the brick into a panelised, prefabricated solution, probably not laid with a robot. And this project's in construction right now. These are photographs that were taken two weeks ago. This is uh, a military base in upstate New York. Um, it's minus 27 degrees Celsius. Uh, we're still working. I had to beg for the photographs because apparently a mobile phone has a, has a lifespan of 40 minutes in this, this temperature. Um, and the interesting thing about this job, uh, two things. One, you can see there's a lot of timber frame happening there as well as CLT. So this is part of the mass reduction. It's like, let's hybridise the two systems and, and prefabricate both and crane them into place at the same time. But the other interesting thing is when it's minus 27 degrees and you get 126 inches of snowfall in one week, this job continued every single day, 10 hours a day, and every other project in Upper New York State shut down and went home. So these photographs, as I said, are a week old. Uh, the building's on level two. They finished the building yesterday. I don't have any update photos, I'm sorry. So I think that's a great story for prefabrication, and it's about eliminating some of that waste, that waste of losing all of that construction time while concrete was waiting to be cured or, or you simply couldn't work in the conditions. And just to finish, uh, in the UK, uh, a project we launched on the weekend with pretty good success was uh, a developed rent project. This is at Deptford. For those of you who don't know London, it's a little bit further east than Greenwich, so it's, um, it's a part of the world that's still gentrifying. Um, very cost sensitive. This is not the part of London where Russian billionaires splurge billions of pounds. So you've really got to get to a, to a very cost effective product. And behind this monolithic brick facade, is again a CLT structure, a lot of modulisation, um, some volumetric prefabrication of the bathrooms. So just to recap, huge growth industry we're in. It's fantastic that there's 1,200 buildings a day to be delivered. Real challenge in terms of are we investing in terms of technology and R&D. I really believe we need to be following systemic approaches to get somewhere in all of this. Um, we think structure can be a gateway drug. Try it. And uh, watch out for construction in a shed.